All right, that's enough nonsense, I think. The Atlanta Hawks are picking first in the draft uh, after winning the lottery, and probably so. And uh, we'll put them on the clock right now. Cal Boone, you're in charge because your last name starts with a B, and none of ours starts with an A or a B. So you're picking first with the number one pick in the 2024 NBA draft. The Atlanta Hawks will do what, in your opinion? Yeah, keep in mind we're doing uh, a mock based on what we would do. Um, mm -hmm. I would I would do the uh, two phones, one for the low uh, first, and I'd be trying to trade out of this pick. Um, don't want it, don't need it. Uh, but if I'm hanging on to number one, I'm going to take Zachary Risache for the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, good size, developing shooter, has really made strides as a shooter the last year. Uh, six foot nine, versatile on both ends of the floor. Not sure if he has star potential, but I think he's a pretty safe prospect, can be kind of a 3 and D and maybe a little bit overqualified 3 and D type prospect. Again, trying to trade out of this pick, but at number one, I, that's who I would take if I had the number one pick. And for, yeah, go ahead, Matt. I want to hop in here. We're not going to, we're not going to just dive into every single pick because frankly, we don't have time for that. However, number one pick, we got to talk about it. I want, I want Fink's uh, evaluation on this pick. I want to know if you guys think that there's any chance that this thing can be traded out of, because it doesn't seem likely. Uh, and, and three, uh, we just GP and I just talked about this on HQ Risa Shea. If he does go number one to me is the most underwhelming number one pick in a long time. Uh, and, I, and I, I feel like, would like a word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> take it, take it over. Fink. I mean, do you think Atlanta has any success trading out of this if it wants to? And, and what do the people need to know about this guy? Because this this is not un, uh, just the way that, that everything's breaking. This is not how you sell the top of a draft. You just don't. Nobody knows who this guy is, and he doesn't. To me, I would agree with KB. He lacks like alpha dominant star quality as a projected number one pick. That's a hundred percent spot on. We we typically don't see a three and D prospect, which is arguably the most coveted archetype of a role player in the NBA, be a candidate to go number one. But that is representative of what you've got in this draft, a draft that lacks obvious star power at the top. Risa Shea is someone that has one of the higher floors for all the reasons uh, Kyle laid out. 3 and D, he defends, he makes shots, he's got good positional size, but we don't know if there are star outcomes there. So part of this for Atlanta is like selling it to ownership, to your fan base of like, hey, you need to keep this in perspective. We can only pick from the players who are available. Um, but I think one of the reasons why you see them taking this to the 11th hour is they're making everyone behind them keep guessing. And in so doing, they are keeping the door open for them to make trade offers. Um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why, why we don't have any clear intel about what they're doing. We heard they're bringing in Modest Buzelis today. Uh, we thought they were choosing between Resushay and Kling. And so they've got everybody guessing. Does anybody? The only guy we think they're not taking, ironically, is Saar, and that's the player who was the betting favorite two weeks ago. Right, and now the favorite is Rishashe at FanDuel. As of this morning, he was like minus 240. Everybody else was plus money. He is the expected favorite to be the number one pick. But remember, I guess it was just two years ago, those betting odds, like they flip dramatically multiple times in the final week leading up to the draft. And, you know, it wasn't clear that Paulo was going to go number one overall until like maybe 10 minutes before he went number one overall. So um, we could have a situation like that. But on SAR, um, just and I know you guys know this, but for people who might not uh, go, OK, why is he not on the board for Atlanta anymore, at least in theory, when he was a few weeks ago, the betting favorite to be the number one pick and has been described as the best prospect in this draft by some people. I don't know if everybody agrees with that. In fact, I'm sure everybody does it, but he has been described that way by son. He has um, declined to go to Atlanta. He hasn't worked out for them. He hasn't met with them. The idea is that he would rather be in Washington than Atlanta. So I don't know if that's a sensible approach. Reasonable people could could uh, argue that different ways. But at this point, it it, it looks like SARS just never going to go to Atlanta. And so they're going to continue to look elsewhere with, again, Richie at this point being the favorite to go number one overall. Number two, Washington Wizards. Think you're on the clock with the second pick. Washington Wizards select whom? Alex Sar. Uh, you've got a, a mobile seven footer who in the modern NBA really projects on the defensive end of the floor because he can slide his feet laterally. He can get off them vertically, although he's still got to build up his body and be able to play through contact, not just when he's on the ground banging, but even in midair as a leaper. Um, and so he, he projects as being able to do all those things that are most coveted in the modern NBA. And he can really cover the court. I mean, this guy at seven feet tall flies around the court and, and makes up space in a hurry. The questions 
are on the offensive end of the floor. Just like we said about Risa Shea, who's who's kind of an unconventional number one. Sar is also an unconventional number one because this is a guy who scored nine points per game in the NBL and doesn't have a, a very clear offensive role just yet. You can buy into the shooting potential. You can buy into the mismatch potential because he's got quick feet and you say, okay, maybe he can play make past less mobile big men if he puts on enough weight to play center. But this is someone who offensively is going to be a work in progress, physically is going to be a work in progress, but defensively has a chance to be one of the more versatile and impactful defenders in this class. Uh, KB, I do want to get your thoughts on this. And just to reiterate, we, we're not going to be able to break down uh, every pick four people at a time. We'll be here for seven hours. We ain't got that kind of time. Neither do you, I hope. But uh, KB, I did want to get your thoughts on Sar. Fink said, um, you know, you can buy into the shooting potential uh, because – um, when you watch him, it looks fine for the most part. And then you look at the, the, the numbers and you go, I don't know what, what the numbers aren't good, but I don't. I, and so think I'd like to get your reaction to that too, because when I watch him shoot, I, that looks like a guy who's going to be able to make shots out to the three point line uh, in the NBA. But the truth is he's never done it reliably yet. Yeah. I feel, confident. You got, yeah. I feel confident that Alex Sar is going to be a really good defender. Uh, in the NBA, and that's where I think his you kind of build his case as a prospect. Um, if he's able to shoot, then you know I think you're talking about a, an outcome where he's maybe like a Jaron Jackson Jr., like in an ideal ideal world. But a lot of things have to go right for him uh, to be you know a defensive player of the year type prospect who can play both inside and out. Uh, you know his, his shot blocking is tremendous. His movement I think is outstanding. He does a lot of things that's very intriguing. And I think if you're talking about just pure potential in this class, Alex Sar probably has the most pure potential. Um, it's just right now, I think I think, you know, the the shooting numbers just aren't quite there. You kind of have to envision three or four years down the line. He, he has to develop a lot within his bag uh, to really pay off as a as a number two pick in this draft. Think real quick, you don't buy the the shooting. I just the the basketball, you know, coaching geek in me, just like, oh, he's driving his shoulders back. He's got a narrow base. The ball gets a little flat. Like his touch is fine. It's so it's it's possible, but it's not like it comes off his hand. Like honestly, I think you could make the case that Zach Eady's shot looked better in like rhythm shooting drills than than Alex Sars can. I know that'll come off like a hot take, but um, you know, that that was uh yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not sold on Sars shooting by any stretch. Matt, third pick. You're on the clock with the third pick in the 2024 <laughs> NBA draft. The Houston oh, Rockets. Are, 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 we, are we doing this with everyone? <laughs> like, are you gonna, oh are you yeah, gonna, no, you have. You have to. That's the way you have to get I, into I, it. I feel like I should have brought you can't. Back you here. can't pick somebody unless yeah. until somebody says right, so you are. Let's the third just be pick. clear. You're a GM and you're Adam Silver for the entire episode. That's right. I shaved okay. my head for this. I shaved my head for this. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you had a suit and tie on before this, and you took it off. I figure you should have kept it on if that was going to be the. If that I, was I, I just. I, I think it always looks silly when people aren't <laughs> dressed similarly. I don't care what the dress code is. It's just I don't need one guy in a suit and another guy in a t-shirt. Let's do t-shirts or or suits, but I you gotcha. can't do them both. I got you, bud. With the third pick now again we are doing this if we were running these franchises and so i am doing this in correspondence with my big board and because of this player's shooting ability his size his athleticism i ever so slightly i have dalton connect ranked as a better prospect long term than reed shepherd so i have the rockets taking dalton connect third overall if i was in this spot running the rockets well I'll tell you what i wouldn't be on this podcast right now but nevertheless I would take connect because I don't I don't hold a player's age against him as much as obviously modern NBA front offices do. I understand the reasons for that. However, uh, I was talking with one person in a, an NBA franchise who actually holds a top 10 pick uh, less than a week ago. And we got into talking about the fact that, you know, injuries are now so common as well. Like th th when you are holding players back because of age or dropping them down a little bit, uh, when you really look at a given draft and, and how careers play out throughout uh some players wind up playing just you know just as less or just as much i should say uh even though they might be three years younger because you can't predict the nature of injuries and how these careers are going to go so if anything this person agreed with me that uh, the ageism that plays into this process has become a little bit overstated with that in mind i will take connect third to houston i think he's a player that can both step in immediately and be an impact player i said this on hq earlier on monday as well Go look at the past three NBA drafts and go look at the following season or two seasons and see how many guys 
We talk about these guys so much, as we should. It's, it's, it's mock draft season. But look how many are actually relevant and impactful players. Like There are going to be so many of these guys that just do not matter whatsoever next season. However, I think Connect in the right spot can be a guy that can step in and average double digits because the shooting is huge. I think it's the most important skill you can have as an NBA player. He's got real legit length, and he's not afraid to put it on the deck and drive to the 10. He's my pick at three to the Rockets. To your point, um, we spend so much time talking about these players leading up to every draft, and then we might really never talk about them again. Like I, the other day, somehow, somewhere, like Grady Dick popped up on my timeline or something, and it just occurred to me. I have not thought about Grady Dick since last June, but last June I talked about him every day, and and then and then he got picked, and I have no idea what happened to him. He had I mean, a twenty game spurt where he was really good. Some okay, of us like, just hung out on this all year long. Yeah, yeah, I just lost track of him. The only thing I know about Grady Dick in the NBA is that he took a picture. Um, with somebody right, else who had a moving. that's it that's all I, I know. know what you're referencing that's keep the only thing moving. I know that he did and and so this one will be this draft will be similar I, we're going to talk about it 30 different players today and about half of them we'll never talk about again I'm a, I'm on the clock if you don't mind go ahead I'm running the San Antonio Spurs <laughs> look at me I'm running the San Antonio <laughs> yeah. Spurs with the fourth pick in the 2024 NBA draft the San Antonio Spurs select Reed Shepard out of the University of Kentucky. I'll be quick on this because I feel like I've said the same thing about him 40 different times in 40 different places. He's my favorite player in this draft. If I were picking first, I would pick Reed Shepard first. I think he's going to be fabulous. I don't think he's going to be a little guy who can make shots in the NBA. I think he can be an all-star level guard in the NBA, a difference maker for a franchise. And buddy, if you are starting something with Victor Wimanyama and this, you know, one of not just the best shooter in this class, but one of the best shooters we've seen in our professional basketball in some time. Um, I feel great about it. If I don't know that Shepard's actually going to be available at four. He, he just happened to be available at four in this mock draft. And I was thrilled when I saw the emails come in. Cause this is, this is the guy again, I would take number one. All right. I want to, I want to queue up Adam real quick. Cause our YouTube subscribers are aware of a, of a take that Adam had on a recent show with KB on their, on their draft stuff. And if you have not been watching that, you need to be doing that. Obviously they've been doing a ton of it leading up to this. Think, what is your? I need you to be. I need you to be declarative about this. You don't believe Reed Shepard is the best shooter in this draft. Why? I think it's debatable. Okay. Um, I I think because and someone I got this on Twitter today. Like if if you just look at the one year sample size at Kentucky, which most people do, then it it's clear he's best shooter in the draft. If you go back and look at high school, um, where he shot according to like synergy and those things that captured over half of his games about thirty three percent from three in high school and uh, in three SSB and various international competitions. So the question I got today is like, well, why is that relevant? Now he shoots 50%. And I said, well, it's relevant for the same reason we should have paid attention to what Jabari Smith's shooting numbers were in high school, because you just want to make sure that the one year of college isn't the outlier. Um, like Jabari Smith, same thing at Auburn. GP mentioned him a, a couple of minutes ago. He was the guy that was supposed to go number one two years ago. He was a driller at Auburn. He hasn't really been a driller since getting to the Houston Rockets. Two years hasn't been above 40% yet. So we've seen that high school was almost more representative than college. Certainly college is the, the better representative, but the point being is that there it's not the only indicator of future success that you have to consider. We'll go to Detroit now. Cal Boom back on the clock with the fifth pick in the 2024 NBA draft. Detroit Pistons select. Kling Kong, Don McClingan. Uh, for the Detroit Pistons, I think he has a chance to go number one on draft night. Um, he's seven foot, uh, best shot blocker in the draft, efficiency darling. He's great finishing around the rim, finished second in all of college basketball last season and player efficiency rating behind uh, none under the Zach Eady. Um, also ranked second in box plus minus. So, you know, UConn was a wagon last season, and that was in no small part because of how dominant Donovan Klingon was in the paint feel really confident that he's going to be a really good NBA player. Uh, and hopefully the shot is going to come through. A lot of people believe that he's going to be able to shoot it from, from long distance. And if that's the case, if he's going to build that and add that to his resume, uh, then yeah, I think he's going to be a top five prospect from this. Class. Let me ask, let me ask you this then. So what, and I don't mean to make you an uh, NBA analyst all of a sudden, but obviously Detroit has Jalen Duran. I only bring this up because this has been a topic of conversation in my hometown. Um, 
if you're the Pistons, if you if Klingon falls to you, do you just take him and say this is our center moving forward, and then you make Jalen Duran available, or do you make the pick available because somebody's going to want to come up and get Klingon, and if you've got Duran and you're happy with him, you might not want to go that direction, but you can get value in a deal like the Grizzlies coming up. You know, what if the Grizzlies gave you nine and a future first to move up to five so that they could take Klingon? Like it, it all like it, it think KB, both of you, just uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I'd be I'd be totally fine uh, moving back if Klingon is still here on the board and I'm the Detroit Pistons. You're in a bad way if you're Detroit right now. Um, you've you've been consistently the worst team in the NBA the last two seasons. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of teams that have a strong appetite to move up for Donovan Klingon. If he ends up falling to number five, I can imagine that the Memphis Grizzlies, for example, at number nine, would be very very hungry to try and move up and probably willing to move a lot of assets, either current or future or some combination of both. If they're going to offer number nine and a future pick next year, um, I would love to take that and think longer term because the Pistons are not just one piece away. They're several pieces away. I think adding some future picks, adding some future resources uh, would do really, really well for the Pistons in the rebuild. Fink, what do you think of all that? So real quick, on, on, my, on my mock, I've got Klingon going third um to houston for a team that he will not play for because i think memphis will make every effort to trade up to get him there are multiple teams exactly. chicago included that would like to get him but memphis is the primary one that is not that is that is a statement i'm making based on intel um i think they they would target the third pick i think they would target the fifth pick i think they would target the sixth pick but all of this is predicated on the fact that atlanta might still take him at number one so none of those transactions can happen until we know what atlanta is doing with that pick that's Real right. quick, I, 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 since we're talking Klingon here, it feels like his uh, highest pick is one. It doesn't seem like he'll drop below six to me, but I think the potential for Atlanta to actually take Klingon at one feels real to me personally. Uh, and part of that is talking with sources. And then the other part, I appreciate Dan Hurley saying this on the record. He was pretty effusive in uh, in his praise for the Hawks and then talking with them about Klingon, who have expressed a lot of interest. Uh, and then, in fact, I, I don't know if one thing led to the other. I don't think that's the case. But I hadn't heard a ton about this publicly. And then when I did the, the Q&A with Hurley for the Lakers stuff, he put it out there. And then the ensuing 48 hours, it just seemed like there was a, a little bit of a surge of the Klingon Atlanta stuff. So we'll see if it's a smoke screen or not. I wouldn't be surprised personally if he went one. But the stuff that Fink just laid out there is super interesting. Klingon, to me, ranks among the three most interesting players in the draft in terms of who he goes to and where he gets picked. And I feel like how he gets selected actually will impact how the lottery plays out thereafter. You can find mock drafts right now who have Kling that have Klingon going number one and Klingon going number seven. That that is wildly unusual to see somebody two days out of the draft see see them projected first somewhere and seventh um, somewhere else. Um, I, I think some people have, uh, you know, assumed that he might really slip to like seven if, if he doesn't go one or two. Because then you get Houston, they already have a center, might not want another one. The Spurs have a center, might not want another one. Pistons have a center, might not want another one. Hornets have a center, might not want another one. But to Fink's point, he and I are on the same page here. There are franchises that value Klingon as a top two, three prospect in this draft. Somebody's going to willing, be willing to come up to three or five to get him. And that's why I, I think he's off the board at, uh, by five at the latest. I, I, I If... if the five franchises picking in the top five, if none of them want them, somebody will, and they'll come up and get Houston's pick or Detroit's pick, and Klingon will get off the board. I think he's gone by six. Uh, Norlander, is it you now? Or it no? is Mr. Finkelstein with the sixth pick. Excuse uh, me, Commissioner. I'm going to be the deputy right here with the sixth pick of the 2024 NBA draft. The Charlotte Hornets select. Steph Castle who uh, is a Kyle Boone favorite. I feel like I should almost uh, yield my allotted time to him to make this pitch. But suffice it to say, um, Boone is higher on Castle than I am. Um, but I love the fit here in Charlotte, where, as you mentioned, they have their center. They have Brandon Miller on the wing. They have LaMelo Ball. But to your previous point about durability, we don't know how many games LaMelo Ball is going to play, especially if he's wearing his family's shoes. Those have not been known to be <laughs> troublesome to your longevity. Um, so Castle gives you on off ball versatility. I think he's best off the ball, but playing him next to a couple of questionable defenders, it allows him to slot right in there and be the defensive alpha of that team. And then when ball is out of the lineup, uh, he can take over the ball handling responsibilities because he can play on off ball. The upside of Castle comes down to this. Do you buy in his shooting long-term or do you not? Uh, I do not. 
but I will say it was less problematic this year at UConn than I anticipated. Still, I think Charlotte would be a great fit for him. Uh, with the seventh pick in the 2024 NBA draft, Matt Norlander, the Portland Trailblazers select 